So this morning, we'll be in 2 Samuel chapter 18, and I've titled today's message, The Battle of a Father and Son. Now, out of all the eventful moments that we've read about so far in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, um, the chapter that we're going to be covering today is probably one of the most dramatic moments in David's life. See, chapter 18 will tell us about the battle between the forces of King David and those of his those who supported his son, Absalom. Now, back in chapter 7, verse 16, God had promised David that his house and kingdom will endure forever and that his throne would be established forever. Yet when God gave that promise, he didn't really get into into the specifics of how all that would occur and when all that would occur or who it would be. From the moment that David heard that his son had declared himself king in chapter 15, he's been running for his life. As he was years earlier when he was being pursued by Saul. Now, throughout this time, he must have been wondering to himself, is this part of God's plan? Is this what God meant? Absalom, the one to take the throne, is he the, is he the heir that will take the throne? Is he the one that's going to build the temple? All these thoughts must have been going through. David says, as maybe has gone through has gone through your mind during stressful situations, during difficult times. Is this part of God's plan? So we're going to see in this chapter that some of these questions, some questions will be answered. The questions of if and how David's kingship would survive and if God would once again come through to deliver the man that he had anointed. Uh, By this this point of our story, the battle of a father and his son is imminent and unavoidable. Absalom and his army are closing in on David and his troops, who, because of intel that was provided, are now just a step ahead and know that they're in a fight, fight for their own survival. The good thing is that the end of chapter 17, we're told that some really good men came through for David and provided some much-needed food and supplies. And so now that they've been able to rest and eat, or eat and rest for a bit, it's time to regroup and prepare for battle. And so this is where chapter 18 picks up. And And towards the end or through this lesson, we're going to see, again, some of the lessons that we also can learn from this. And I think one of the biggest thing is, one of the biggest themes here that that we will see and that you will learn is is just perspective. That David's perspective just got warped because of all this situation. And, And it's understandable as a parent. As, as a father, you care for your children. You love for chil- you love your children. I love my boys and my and my daughter, and I want nothing for the best for them. And you know, if they rebelled against me, and you know, and I I still would want anything bad happen to them. And sometimes our minds they can get so I guess enveloped in 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 the protection of our children that we forget. We lose sight of what what's really important, what really matters. We lose sight of the promises of God, and we lose sight that, you know, God's really in control and in charge. So, among other things, that's something that we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about as well. So, before we get into chapter 18, let's let's pray and 
ask the Lord to meet us this morning. Heavenly Father, um, it was such a wonderful time of worship that we had this morning, and you know, I, I know that you that these songs that we sing to you, Lord, are deep down from the heart, and and that you receive them and and you enjoy them, Lord. They're just beautiful sounds to you, Lord, and so. We're thankful that we're able to have the, the breath to sing them, the lips to sing them, Lord, the eyes to read the words, and that you created these beautiful songs, Lord. They use these great people to write these beautiful songs that um, give you the glory. And so now, Lord, we want to continue to give you the glory by, as we open up your word, your truth, and allow your spirit to minister to us now, to speak to us powerfully, Lord, to plant those seeds that need to be planted into our hearts, Lord. So I ask you that you will soften hearts right now, those that are here, Lord, um, remove the distractions. To so those who are watching, listening, that you will also remove distractions, Lord. And if they need to pull over the side of the road and just... And just listen for a while, Lord. I pray that you will watch over them and protect them. Keep them safe, Lord. And, and may you also speak loudly through this message, through your word. So again, fill this room with your spirit, Lord. May we hear from you powerfully now. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Second Samuel chapter 18. The word of God says, David reviewed his troops and appointed commanders of thousands and of hundreds over them. He then sent out the troops, a third under Joab, a third under Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zeruiah, and a third under Ittai of Gath. The king said to his troops, I must also watch out or march out with you. You must not go, the people pleaded. If we have to flee, they will not pay attention to us. Even if half of us die, they will not pay attention to us, because you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, it is better for you to support us from the city. I'll do whatever you think is best, the king replied to them. So he stood beside the city gate while all the troops marched out by hundreds and thousands. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Etai Treat the young man Absalom gently for my sake. All the people heard the king's orders to all the commanders about Absalom. Then David's forces marched out into the field to engage Israel in battle, which took place in the forest of, in the forest of Ephraim. Israel's army was defeated by David's soldiers, and the slaughter there was vast that day, 20,000 dead. The battle spread over the entire area. And that day, the forest claimed more people than the sword. Absalom was riding on his mule when he happened to meet uh, David's soldiers. When the mule went under the under, when the mule went under the tangled branches of a large oak tree, Absalom Absalom's head was caught fast in a tree. The mule under him kept going, so he was suspended in midair. One of the men saw him and informed Joab and informed Joab. He said, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. You just saw him? Joab exclaimed, Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? I would have given you ten silver pieces and a belt. The man replied, Even if I had the weight of a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For we heard the king's command for we heard the king command you, Abishai and Etai, protect the young man Absalom for me. If I had jeopardized my own life and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have you would have abandoned me. Joab said, I'm not going to waste my time with you. He then took three spears in his hand and thrust them into Absalom's chest. While Absalom was still alive in the oak tree, 
10 young men who were Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Joab blew the ram's horns, the ram's horn, and the troops broke off their pursuit of Israel because Joab restrained them. They took Absalom, threw him into a large pit in the forest, and raised up a huge mound of stones over him. And all Israel fled, each to his tent. When he was alive, Absalom had taken a pillar and raised it up for himself in a king's valley, since he thought, I have no son to preserve the memory of my name. So he named the pillar after himself. It is still called Absalom's monument today. And um, I'll stop there for, for now. Knowing that the enemy is coming and they're, they're about to arrive, the chapter begins by telling us that David reviewed his troops. He numbered his troops. He did a troop inspection and then divided them into three companies. Placed Joab, Abishai, and Ittai as their commanders. Now, David wanted really bad to accompany, go with his uh, army and participate or somehow be part of the coming battle. But the people persuaded him, hold on, David, hold up just a second. Don't go, please, don't go with us. Just remain in the city of Mahani. They essentially said that if they had to retreat, during the battle, or even if half of them died in this battle, the enemy wouldn't pay much attention to it. They would ignore it. And for the most part, the fight would just continue. But since he was, he himself, David, was worth 10,000 of them, his death would just be a demoralizing blow to the entire army and whole cause would be lost. And also by being in the city, there he'd be able to send support, reinforcements, if it was needed. Well, reluctantly, David accepted their decisions and he stood beside the city gate and watched his troops as they marched out, as they departed as it deployed, and as they were marching by, they heard him say something else. They heard him tell his commanders to treat the young man Absalom gently for my sake. Now, what's interesting is that in chapter 15, Absalom had stood at the gate at Jerusalem and attacked his father. But here, David, we see David standing at a city gate, instructing his men to go easy on Absalom. Now, we've already seen several instances of how Absalom had, hadn't been gentle with his father. He had murdered his brother Ammon driven David out of Jerusalem, seized his throne, violated David's concubines, and now he was all out. He was out trying to kill David. So he wasn't taking it easy on his father. He wanted to destroy him. He wanted to do everything possible to get rid of him, his memory. Now, that doesn't sound like the kind of man you would want to protect. But David, David the father, not the king, but David the father had a weakness. He had a soft spot for being overly protective, being way too easy on his sons. But before we now begin to criticize David for his weakness. We must remember that David 
was a man after God's own heart. And with this in mind, we too, we ourselves, we ought to be thankful that our Father in heaven hasn't dealt with us according to our sins, according to the things that we have done in the past and that we sometimes still do on a daily basis, that we still, you know, we all still sin. We're still all, all sinners. We're not perfect. We mess up. But he doesn't deal with us in the same way, you know, like, you know, like any maybe mean father would deal with a kid. No. As his children now, he deals with us gently and kindly, and lovingly, because of his grace, and because we're covered by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. In his grace, he gives us we what we don't in his grace he gives us what we don't deserve and in his mercy he doesn't give us what we do deserve jesus didn't deserve to die for he was sinless yet he took the punishment that we deserve that belonged to us man what a savior what a Savior we have in Jesus. Well, in verses 6 through 8, we're told that the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim, east of the Jordan and near Mahanim. In that fight, Absalom, we're told, suffered 20,000 casualties, 20,000 of his troops fell dead, which, again, we're told here, was mostly caused by the dense forest than by being killed with a sword. Well, by the time the dust settled and the bodies had been counted, it was clear to everyone that David's army had been victorious. But before any celebration could begin, the mission to find Absalom, dead or alive, now became the priority. But here's the thing. God didn't need a sword to stop the rebellious Absalom. He simply used the branch of a tree. Now, in some translations, some versions, um, it's been said that he was actually stuck there in the branch by his hair. Um, here, it we're told that it was his neck, but the idea is the same. He was stuck there through his head, you know, with his head, um, and his hair got, in, you know, for the most, more than likely got entangled there. We have to remember his, his hair weighed, what did he say, five pounds his, when, it, when it was at its full length? Um, so it was a lot of hair and it was heavy. So how much his heavy hair, his, his head of hair contributed to this accident isn't recorded, but it's ironic that the thing that he was so proud of, the thing that made that distinguished him, that he can just, you know, that people can point out and say, oh yeah, that's Absalom, turned out to assist in his death. It says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, that pride comes before destruction. And this is a good example of that. Now, another similar example is the story of Samson. Samson. In Judges 16, his hair also became the source, was the source of his pride and was also the cause of his downfall. See, it's true what it says in Job chapter 5, verse 13. He catches the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the cunning quickly upon them. 
Well, as our current story continues, the soldiers who encountered Absalom hanging from the tree, they're like, they didn't dare touch him. They're like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do anything. We're just gonna report what we see and and uh, let let Joab know. We read that Joab had his own agenda. And maybe it was because Joab had already, he knew what David was going to do. He already had this experience with, um, with David and Absalom about trying to get them reunited. And he knew that David was just, you know, wasn't going to do anything, was going to be soft with him. And so he took matters into his own hands. It was Joab who had orchestrated the reconciliation of David and Absalom. And now Joab ignored David's orders and killed Absalom's son, the Ab- Absalom's or David's son, Absalom, the young man. It's also ironic that in chapter 17, verse 2, Absalom had rejected Ahithophel's plan to strike down only the king. But Joab accepted it. Now in verse 11, it seems as if Joab may have, Joab may have already hinted to his troops that he would reward any soldier who killed the rebellious son. But it appears that the soldier who could have won the reward, it's like, nah, I'm not going to go through with it. He decided not to back down and, and to not go through with it for a couple of reasons. Number one, he didn't want to disobe- disobey the king. And number two, he wasn't sure Joab would defend him if the king, David, had found out about it. See, the soldier probably had in mind the time David killed the man who said he had killed Saul in chapter 1 as well as the two men in chapter 4 who had killed Saul's son, Ishibosheth. So he put these things together and probably thought to himself, or he knew that Joab didn't want to be caught issuing an order to the king's son when the king commanded otherwise. He's like, no, he's going to throw me under the bus. And those of you who've been in the military, you know that it all rolls downhill. Usually those in command, they just, you know, they're just following orders and they'll, you know, but usually it's the ones underneath that are, that suffer the most. They're the ones who usually take the brunt of any kind of um, mistakes that those commanders make. Well, after driving three spears, into Absalom's chest. Absalom still wasn't dead. Verse 14 says that he still hadn't died. He still had some life in him. So Joab's 10 armor bearers, like, I don't know, I imagine just a bunch of like these zombies, I don't know, these, you know, ravaging animals, these wolves, just proceeded to take hold of him, to strike him down, and to take his last breath, to kill him. Now, one commentator said this, Absalom only received what he deserved. He was a murderer, a traitor, and a rapist. Joab knew that David was generally indulgent towards his children and and would never punish Absalom. He had seen David's action towards his sons characterized by lack of discipline. In the highest interest of the kingdom, his hand was raised to slay Absalom. Now, some of you may be thinking that Joab was correct, but not right. But here's the thing. Joab was correct in understanding that it was better for David and for Israel that Absalom be killed, that it'd be better if he was dead. But he wasn't right in disobeying the king. 
the God-appointed authority over him by David's dealings with King Saul. We see that God can deal with those in authority. Furthermore, we don't need to disobey them unless commanded to by Scripture or a clear conscience. So if you have issue, problems with those in authority, whether it's your bosses or whether it's the local government, you know, state government, federal government, those in, in charge, leave it to God. Yes, we have, we, you know, we, we're fortunate that we have a say in the ballot box on election day. But ultimately, God will judge them, each one of those leaders, because of the way they led. Especially in powerful nations like our own. But... You don't, go have, you don't have to go out there and start your own little revolution. Again, God, it's in his hands. You know, if, you, if, if a revolution is what he desires, if that's what he, that's part of his plan, then he'll make it so. Don't go out there and try to, you know, take matters, you know, try to take down these authorities just because you feel like it. Um, again, we don't need to disobey them unless commanded to by scripture or a clear conscience. Well, Absalom is dead. At one point, he was the most popular, well-liked man in Israel. People came to him, sought his advice. People kissed his hand, bowed to him. He was the most popular person in that area, in that region, in that nation. But in the end, it says that he was buried in a large pit under a huge mound of stones. Apparently, 1427 says that he that a uh, chapter 14 verse 27 says that his three sons had died so there was no one left to carry on his family name so while he was alive he made arrangements to have a pillar erected to preserve the memory of his name now what i found out was that today that original pillar is gone and the so-called tomb of Absalom that stands there today that tourists go to and, and visit in the Kindron Valley was actually built many hundreds of years later during the days of, of the Herods. So it's not the original monument. It's not the original um, Absalom monument. Now, this reminds me of a verse found in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7. It says, the remembrance of the righteous is missing, but the name of the wicked will rot. Well, now that Absalom is dead, it meant that the battle and the rebellion was finally over. So Joab gave the signal for David's men to stop pursuing Absalom's troops, who in turn had fled each to his own tent. Paul be scared about what was going to happen to them. What would be their punishment for turning against the king? Well, the last section tells us how David now reacted to the news of his son's death. So let's pick up in verse 19 or 20 and finish off this chapter. 2 Samuel chapter 18 verse 19. Ahimaaz 
the, the uh, son of Zadok said, Please let me run and tell the king the good news that the Lord has vindicated him by freeing him from his enemies. Joab replied to him, You are not the man to take the good news today. You may do it another day, but today you aren't taking good news because the king's son is dead. Joab then said to a Cushite, Go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed to Joab and took off running. However, Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, persisted and said to Joab, No matter what, please let me also run behind the Cushite. Joab replied, My son, why do you want to run since you won't get a reward? No matter what, I want to run. Then run, Joab said to him. So Ahimaaz ran by way of the plain and outran, outran the Cushite. David was sitting between the city gates when the watchman went up to the roof of the city gate and over the wall. The watchman looked out and saw a man running alone. He called out and told the king. The king said, if he is alone, he bears good news. As the first runner came closer, the watchman saw another man running. He called out to the gatekeeper, look, another man is running alone. This one also bring, is bringing good news. The said the king. The watchman said, the way the first man runs looks to me like the way Ahima, son of Zadok, runs. This is a good man. He comes with good news, the king commented. Ahima called out to the king, all is well, and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. He continued, blessed be the Lord your God. He delivered up the men who rebelled against, rebelled against my lord, the king. The king asked, is the young man Absalom all right? Ahimaaz replied, when Joab sent the king's servant and your, and your servant, I saw a big disturbance, but I don't know what it was. The king said, move aside and stand here. So he stood to one side. Just then the Cushite came and said, the Lord has vindicated you today by freeing you from all who rise against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom all right? The Cushite replied, I wish the enemies of my lord, the king, along with all who rise up against you with evil intent, would become like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber above the city gate and wept. As he walked, he cried, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, if I had only died instead of you, Absalom, my son, my son. You can't help but to feel for David losing a son that he cared for, that he loved for, that he loved. I wasn't going to allow, I was going to try not to let it get to me. But again, these stories are so real to me. They are real to me. And I, could, I feel for David. My sons are off and, you know, and if something happened to me, it would, I'm sure it would break my heart. I'm sure it would break Robin's heart. We'd be crushed, but, you know, it just would be really, really hard. Um, well, with uh, war and rebellion over all that remained was for Joab to now notify the king and return him safely back to Jerusalem. But it was a bitter, sweet victory for David. When the enemy is your own son, there can be no triumph and no celebration. Ahimaaz was a well-known runner. Remember, he was a spy. He was one of the priest's sons, and he would regularly send messages, get these messages, intel from Jerusalem, and send it, take it to David. So he was used to, he was a good runner. So this time he again volunteered to take the news to, to the king at Mahanim, which was about three miles away. As enthusiastic as this young man was, 
he didn't realize what he was asking. See, chapter 14 showed us that David was known to take out his anger and and sorrow on bad news messengers. Ahimaaz wanted to give David the good news that you've won, you've victorious, you've, you've beaten your enemies. But the fact is, how could the death of Absalom be any good news to David? Joab knew this about his king. He knew this very well and knew that the report of Absalom's death must be conveyed with compassion, with skill, with tact. So to keep Ahima safe, Joab selected a person only known as the Cushite, who was probably one of his own servants to relay the news. And maybe he thought to himself, if anyone was going to be killed, better that it's better that a foreign servant, that it be a foreign servant, that he be killed instead of the son of a Jewish priest. However, after the Kushite left, after he was given his task and told to go, Ahimaaz continued to ask and annoy Joab continue to ask him for permission to run, to just go, whatever happens, let me go, let me go run and tell him. There was nothing good or bad to add to the news. So why run? What's the reward in that? You're not going to get anything out of it. But he wanted to go anyway, so tired of hearing the young man's pleas, Joab gave him permission. He said, go, run, go. Go do what you want to do. Ahimaaz reminds us of those bothersome people, those bothersome people who want to be important but have nothing much to say. We've all encountered those kind of people who have that mentality, have that mindset that I'm important but don't really have, or just, you know, they're fools. They don't have anything important to say, nothing much to say. Well, nothing much that matters. This Kushite took the long road. Oh, this Kushite, yeah, he took the, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, Ahimaaz took the long easy route to Mahanim through the valley, while the Kushite took the short, direct route over difficult terrain. Ahimaaz was a young man without a real message or the, reliab- or the ability to convey that message in the right way. But the Kushite, as he ran, he probably meditated and rehearsed how he was going to tell the king that the son was dead. The point and lesson here is that what's the sense in running if you don't know how to share the news? Why run? What's, just take your time. If you have to give someone bad news or you think it's good news, stop and think. Especially if you know this person is going to be hard and difficult and you don't know how he's going to take the news. Stop and just ask the Lord, Lord, give me the right words to say. It's wise. These are wise words. You know, it'll, get you into, it'll get you out of a lot of issues, a lot of problems, a lot of arguments. To just When you just stop and think and prepare for how you're going to speak to somebody, especially if you're delivering bad news. The scene then shifts to Mahanim, where David is seated seated between the outer and inner gates of the city, waiting, watching, 
waiting for that watchman in the tower to give him, give him word that the messenger is on his way from the battlefield. Now, even though he was unprepared to speak to the king, Ahimaaz put forth every effort and passed the Cushite on the road. Now, when David was told that about both runners coming up the road, David said about each of them, oh, he's a good man and was bringing good news. See, for David, it didn't matter who was bringing the news. It could have been someone he didn't like. It could have been someone that he wasn't fond over or fond of. It could have been it could have been anybody. It didn't matter what kind of character they had. He was just looking for every and any sign of hope that he could hold on to. Did we win? Did my son survive? Oh, he's got to be bringing the good news. He's got to be. He's got to be. He was just focused on that. He couldn't see anything else. He couldn't. It's almost as if he stopped putting these, this his whole entire situation in the Lord's hands and was, you know, saying, you know what? He wanted the best outcome. He wanted to be victorious and he wanted his son to be alive. He was holding on to that hope. Well, Ahimaaz was so anxious to give the news that even before he could catch his breath, he called out, all is well, all is good, everything's fine, there's no issues, no problems, all thumbs up, Robin, thumbs up. <laughs> um, all is well. He came to the king, bowed before him, and told him that Joab had won the battle. But when David asked him about his son, about Absalom, the young messenger wasn't prepared or equipped to share the bad news. So he basically told him, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure what happened. There's, there was an incident there, there was commotion, there was disturbance, and, but I don't know, I don't know what happened. See, in his feeble attempt to go down in history as a man who brought the news from the forest of Ephraim to Mahanim, Ahimaaz had nothing, ended up having nothing to say that David wanted to hear. Now, what he said was correct, but he didn't say enough. So what ended up happening? He ended up standing to one side and watching the Cushite deliver the right message in the right way. In the, New Living, in the New Living Translation, verse 33 says that David was overcome with emotion. In other translations, it says that he was visibly shaking, shaken when he heard the news of his son. When he comprehended, when he discovered that Absalom had been killed. No doubt, before all this, he had been praying that the worst wouldn't happen. But nevertheless, it did. Now, I love what Spurgeon said about this. Our children, our children may plunge into the worst of sins, but they are our children still. They may scoff at our God. They may tear our heart into pieces with their wickedness. We cannot take complacency. We cannot take complacency in them. But at the same time, we cannot unchild them, nor ease their image from our hearts. It's so true. Now, it could also be said that David had actually pronounced his own sentence back in chapter 12, verse 5, when he said to Nathan, remember that story he, Nathan had told him about the story of a lamb that was taken from a poor man? That rich man taking a, uh, a poor man's only lamb and had slaughtered it and had, yeah, had 
you know, given it to as, as a feast when he had his own lambs. And if you remember again that story there in chapter 12, verse 5, David said, he must pay four lambs for that lamb. And now here, he was paying the final payment of his great debt. The baby had died. Tamar was raped. Am, Amnon had, was murdered. And now Absalom was dead. David was once again tasting the pain of forgiven sin. His tears reveal the heart, the broken heart of a loving father. Speaking about David's sorrow, Spurgeon also said this, it would be wise to sympathize as far as, as, far as we can and to sit in judgment upon a case which has never been our own. See, David wept when he heard about the death of Jonathan and Saul, the murder of Abner and the murder, the murder of Amnon. So why shouldn't he weep over the death of his beloved son, Absalom? Once again, we see here the heart of God revealed in the heart of David. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, or chapter 5, verse 7 through 10 tells us that Christ died for us even when we were sinners and living as enemies of God. David said in verse 33 here that he would have died for Absalom. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus did die for us. He died for you. And just as I mentioned a minute ago, in the following chapter, in chapter when we get to chapter 19 next week, we're going to see Joab rebuke David because his values had gotten entirely messed up. In Joab's words, words, David had come to love his enemies and hate his friends. In other words, his actions were saying that he cared more about the well-being of his arch enemy than he does the nation whom he's supposed to shepherd under God. David came to care more about one member of his family than everyone else. In this, David was wrong, and Joab was right. Now, David was wrong to instruct his commanders not to harm Absalom. Everyone but David knew that his rebellious son should have died several times over. He should have died for the premeditated murder of Amnon, against the law, which was against the law. He should have died for his rebellion against his father. He should have died for high treason in seeking to kill God's anointed king and appoint himself as king. Oh, can David expect his army to fight against Absalom's army and not fight against Absalom? As David once used his authority to condemn a righteous man, Uriah, to death. He now seeks to use his authority to keep a revolutionary, an usurper, from the death penalty that he deserves. Here we see that David's perspective is completely messed up. It's out of sorts. It takes Joab's sharp rebuke to bring him out of this mindset, out of this deteriorating mental state. Now, I, I'd like to suggest that just as David lost 
his perspective in our text. We often lose our perspective without even being aware of it. For example, we know that this world and all that is in it is fading away. It's all going to end. It's all going to burn away. It's all going to disappear in the twinkling of an eye. And yet, we persist to accumulate things. We persist on being consumers to gather more stuff, more junk that we're not going to be able to take with us in eternity. We want to be the top person. We want higher positions. We want more money. We want more toys. We want more things. We, we, pers- we persist in those things. We lay up treasure on earth rather than laying up treasure in heaven. And we also know that the Bible says that the lost, those who haven't surrendered their lives to Jesus, are going to spend eternity in hell, separated eternally from God. And yet, we often fail to show these very same people, unbelievers, the love of Christ, or to share the gospel with them. This could be our neighbors, this could be our co-workers, our schoolmates, class, you know, classmates. Um, be that person that just annoys you. It could be that, that person living in sin. That's, that you often meet up with on a regular basis. How much do you really care for that person? You should, as a Christian, as a believer, you should have a deep longing in your heart for their eternal soul, for their salvation. I would hate to, and I, I think there are going to be a lot of occasions that, uh, you know, the Lord's going to, one day, I'm going to be up in heaven, He's going to judge me for the things I've done here. And you say, remember that time you could have shared the gospel with this person, but you didn't because you were scared, you were worried about your reputation, you were worried about what people were going to say. You know, I think about that. I do think about that a lot. You know, and I, you know, I, I tell the Lord, you know, I pray that the Lord would just continue to give me the, the wisdom, the strength, the, the, the to see the right time in the right place to share the gospel. But if not, just to share the love of Christ, to share with others through my actions the love of Christ. So with this in mind, can you see that our perspective can be just as badly warped as David's? We see David placing the well-being of his son Absalom over the well-being of the rest of his family and over the rest of David's kingdom. In this case, has David not put family above more important things? Has David refused to deal with his son as, uh, as his sin deserved, seeking to spare him? Do we not refuse to deal with the disobedience and rebellion of our own children, fearing we might lose them? Do we not refuse to discipline a brother or sister in Christ because we can't bear the thought of losing them or maybe even losing how much they're doing for us or have done for us? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I'm not guilty of these things myself, of of doing these things at one time or another. But when I become aware of it, I'm convicted and I repent. And I ask the Lord again to change my heart, 
to change my perspective, to show me his will, to show me his love, to give it to others, to not be so selfish. So the question is, what do you do when you become aware of it? When you become aware of these things, do you just ignore it and brush it aside and say, you know, oh well, you know, maybe that person does deserve hell. If that goes through your mind, oh my goodness, you know, it's, it's really nobody, nobody at all that ever lived in history, no matter how evil they were, deserves well, they, well, you know, their sins, yeah, because of their sins, you know, they, that's where they're you know, ultimately go. But it, that's not what hell was created for. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. No one deserves to be eternally separated from God. He knew this, he was aware of this, and so he... From eternity past, he came up the way to bring man and himself together, to be reconciled. Let us learn from David that all of us, we can all lose our perspective quickly without ever knowing it. The only way we can maintain a proper perspective is to continually saturate ourselves with the Word of God. It's in the Bible, in the Word of God, that we gain a true perspective, a true biblical perspective. I was once asked, you know, what, and this is a side note, I was, you know, I, I was asked, you know, what shapes my, my political views? And I say the Bible does. I read the Bible and it shapes the way I make my decisions in the ballot box. But if it means that you're going to stumble or you're going to, you know, it's going to cause you to, to, to hate me. I just, I, I would rather not share that with you. You know, just keep it to myself. So yes, you know, he changes the word of God, reading it, understanding it, saturating ourselves with it. It changes the way we look at the world. It changes the way you see yourself. You see people. And you see, you see God himself. Maybe at one time you just didn't understand. God seems foreign or God was maybe someone that you had to do all kinds of things to, to please. But as you got to know him, you understood that it's not that way. He just wants faith, obedience. He wants to have that relationship with you. And the only way, again, you can have that perspective is through His Word of God or through the Word of God. But see, here's the thing. The only way to truly begin seeing things from God's perspective is by having the Spirit of God living in you. Do you open up the Bible? Do you open up the, the Word of God and you're like, I don't understand anything it says here. These stories seem foreign to me. These, there's too many names, too many pronunciation. There's too, you know, I go to the Old Testament and I just, I, I, I have to stop reading after the first chapter because it just, I, I get too distracted. I say these things because that used to be me. I wanted to know what it said, but I just couldn't. You know, I wanted to understand God, but I couldn't because I didn't have the Spirit of God living in me. I didn't understand it. 
I didn't understand what the Spirit of God... It wasn't until, again, he showed me through different people and through reading his word that, you know, it just it, there was something that I read. One day I'll share that story with you, but I was like, I need to be born again. So I sat there in my bed and prayed. I was in that church. I didn't go up in front of the entire congregation. I was reading the book of John, and I realized I needed to be born again. So I prayed the prayer that I've often heard on TV and I've been heard other preachers preach about and say, and I accepted him into my heart. And from that moment on, the word of God became alive, became active. And that's how I knew the Holy Spirit was living in me. And that's how you will know the Holy Spirit is truly living in you. Because those chapters, those books that once seemed foreign to you, like a different language, now become clear. It now makes sense. And the more you read it, the more you fall in love, the more you just, it, as I mentioned in the beginning, it, it does, it becomes real. These stories are real and they become real and you can feel them. You can feel the pain. You can feel the joy in these characters' lives. You can feel the pain that Jesus suffered on the cross for you. An innocent man who didn't do anything. You can feel the pain and it, it moves you. Touches you. Man, that's, I can try to describe that feeling as much as I can, but the only way you'll really truly know is but when you feel it yourself. It's more than just sympathizing, it's more than just empathy. It's actually, it becomes real. The Word of God becomes real and you feel it. You really, really feel it. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you watching and listening, the only way to have the Spirit dwell in you, the only way He can dwell in you is by becoming born again. By confessing your sins, confessing that you're a sinner, repenting of your sins, accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Believing in Him, trusting in Him by faith. It, again, He will come upon you powerfully and live in the Holy Spirit will come powerfully and live in you. So, if that's what you want to do, if you're ready now, if you see your need for a Savior, you see now that you're, just to let you know, you know, in a sense, as an unbeliever, you're battling, right? There's a battle. We're all created by God. We're all, you know, in a sense, His children. Separated children. And then there's those that have been restored into their relationship. So stop battling. And if you're ready to stop battling, you're ready to surrender. You're ready to give your all, give your entire heart to Jesus and have him change your heart, your perspective, your mind, the way you live. And I want to lead you to the cross. And when you're at, and there, you can humbly come before him. And I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray this to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn for my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me 
in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, congratulations. You're now been reconciled by God. You're now a child, a born again child of God. You've been adopted into his family and there are angels celebrating in heaven right now because of that. And if that's the case, please reach out to us. Let us know. You want to hear your story. You want to know how that came to be, how you came to hear this message. But um, yeah, it's a great time. So now it's time to surround yourselves with other believers to find a good Bible believing, a good Bible teaching church that you're going to learn the Word of God from. And if you need help with that, we can, if you're not here in the area, we can help, or in the area, we can help you find a good church um, that will teach you the Word of God. Um, but also, if you are nearby, we want to invite you to come check us out here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. Um, our doors will be open, will always be open, regardless of what your background is. It doesn't matter. You know, we don't, you know, I don't judge, you know, and I'm not going to, you know, stand here and, you know, I don't, it doesn't matter what you look like. Come by and, you know, and tell us your story. I totally believe that I'm not going to change you. No one here is going to change you. God will be the one to change you. So that's what if you des- if that's what you desire again we want to invite you to come check us out here. Um thank you for taking the time to be with us uh today whatever day it may be. Um I hope that you will be able to join us next week as we continue on our story here next week we're going to be seeing the, just a deep depression that that David felt after the death of his his son and how he got how, how he was able to get out of it. So if you're dealing with depression, uh, believe me, you, this is probably a mess. Next week is going to be a message you want to to hear. So for now, I I hope you have a great week. Um, please be careful out there. Um, and uh, yeah, just be a light, you know, uh, out there, and be the light and salt of uh of god so for now goodbye and we'll see you next week we love you